The Fourier transform converts a signal into a frequency domain representation consisting of cosines and sines. The frequency domain is simply a visualization of the same signal as the original, but with frequency along the horizontal axis rather than space or time. The output of the discrete Fourier transform, or DFT, is an array of complex numbers, encoding how much of each frequency is present in a given signal, and by how much it is shifted. The real component of the output corresponds to the amount of cosines of each frequency that are needed to reconstruct the signal, and the imaginary component corresponds to the amount of sines. Shift is encoded as the relative proportions of each of these for a given frequency, since a cosine wave is simply a horizontally shifted sine wave. The discrete Fourier transform algorithm is very simple. Here is a mathematical formulation of it. The transform, big H for each frequency u, is equal to the sum over all time points of the product of the time domain signal, little h of t, with a complex harmonic function of frequency u. The e term with the exponent expands to a sum of a cosine and i, the imaginary number, times a sine, both of the same frequency u, with respect to the length of the signal. The transform is computed as the dot product for each frequency u of a sine and cosine of that frequency with the original signal. Here is the pseudocode for the DFT algorithm. The deconstruction is very straightforward. In the outer loop, we are asking the question, how much of each frequency is present in the signal? We answer this by iterating over each frequency u and generating the corresponding weights for cosine and sine of that frequency. We initialize these to zero and begin the computation. In the inner loop, we are simply computing a similarity metric between a generated sinusoid of frequency u and the original signal. This is computed as a simple dot product, which is a pointwise sum of products over the length of the entire signal. As in all dot products, the product is maximized when the two signals are identical. We compute this function for both a cosine and a sine. I will demonstrate this in the user interface. Here is my time domain signal, little h of t, shown in green on both plots so we can visualize both halves of the transform. I begin constructing my frequency domain weights by computing the dot product of the signal with a generated cosine and sine wave of each possible frequency, starting at zero. The blue line shows the generated sinusoid. The one on the top is cosine, the one on the bottom is sine. A sinusoid of frequency zero is a flat line. This enables us to include an offset in the reconstruction of the function. The red and black areas are shown for convenience. They represent the positive and negative components, respectively, of the dot product of the two functions. The correlation coefficient, seen on the right, is the sum total of these areas. If the signal is positively correlated with the sinusoid we are testing, this coefficient will be positive. If it is negatively correlated, it will be negative. If it is uncorrelated, it will be approximately zero. And so we iterate over each frequency, computing this coefficient as the dot product of the signal with the sinusoids of the given frequency under test. This is the value that we plot in the frequency domain with real values corresponding to the cosine correlation coefficient and imaginary values corresponding to the sine coefficient. Notice that the signal begins to encounter some aliasing at the frequency n over 4. It still retains sufficient information to uniquely identify the frequency until we get to the frequency n over 2, beyond which aliasing takes over completely and the unrepresentable frequencies appear as lower frequencies of the signal. Notice the sinusoids, rather than getting more compact, are spreading out again. And we are done. That is all. The discrete Fourier transform computes a dot product for two different time-shifted sinusoids with the input signal for each frequency that may be present in the signal. Technically, the maximum frequency represented in the signal is the Nyquist frequency, which is equal to one half of the sampling rate. So the second half of the frequencies u that are sampled would be aliased, meaning they will appear indistinguishable from a frequency that is present in the first half. As it turns out, the aliasing patterns are symmetric or antisymmetric to the original frequencies, as we can see here.